بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما واصلح لنا شاننا كله ولا تكلنا الى انفسنا طرفه عين الحمد لله we here for another session going through uh, and reflecting upon the ahadith in this uh, tremendous book riyad al-salihin by al-imam al-nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala riyad al-salihin meaning the gardens of the righteous so last uh, last week we did the introduction again and we went through the whole introduction as well as uh, the first hadith in the beginning of the first chapter so we're still in the first chapter which is babu ikhlas wa ihdar al-niyyah fi jami' al-a'mal wal aqwal al-bariza wal khafiya which means the chapter about sincerity right intent the sincere uh, intention and wa ihdar al-niyyah and to have the niyyah present in all of our actions whether those actions are things that we do or things that we say whether they are hidden or apparent and we talked about the ayat at the beginning of the chapter as well as the first hadith which was the hadith of Umar ibn Khattab right innama al-a'malu bin niyat and we mentioned that uh, that hadith as well as the other hadith we're going to see here are all emphasizing the importance of the intention and the niyyah okay and from the things we mentioned is that what indicates the importance of the niyyah is that the intention is from the conditions that are required for the actions that we do to be accepted. So any amal that we do, it will not be accepted unless the intention is sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake, and it's according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu So one of the conditions of our action to be accepted is sincerity, okay? So we'll see in these other hadith coming up where the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning in different uh, narrations and Imam al nawawi he brought these hadith together because these hadith indicate something connected to the topic of the, the intentions inshaAllah ta'ala. So we're going to continue from hadith number two inshaAllah and we'll ask Shaykh uh, Safwan to begin with that. Fadl Shaykh. This hadith uh, was narrated by Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Abdullah Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha is the wife of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she is the daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And as the Imam mentioned here, he said, Umm al-Mu'mineen. This word means the mother of the believers. And this is a title for all of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Referring to them to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, that they are the mothers of the people of Iman. And Nabiyu Aula bil Mu'minina min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. Right? So Allah mentions in that ayah that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ are the mothers of this uh, of the Ummah of Muhammad. ﷺ. And Ummu Abdullah was her kunya, even though Aisha radiallahu anha did not have any children, but the Prophet ﷺ told her to take the kunya and to give herself the kunya, and kunya means when you call yourself the father of so-and-so, or the mother of so-and-so, okay? And Abdullah is referring to the, her nephew, the daughter of, the son of her sister. So Abdullah here is Abdullah ibn Zubair, because her sister Asma bint Abi Bakr was married to Zubair ibn Awam. So the Prophet ﷺ told Aisha to take the kunya of your, your son, but she's referring to her nephew, which was Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn Awam, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Tayyip. Aisha radiyallahu anha, of course she's from the uh, companions who narrated the most ahadith of the, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tayyip. She's from amongst the, as the title is known as Mukthirin, 
the one who narrated the most narrations from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Aisha is from amongst them may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her and her virtues and her fada'il are many but we're not going to get into it because we want to uh, save time and go through the ahadith inshallah ta'ala may Allah be pleased with Aisha she said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said yaghzu jayshun al kaaba an army will attack or attempt to invade and attack the Kaaba. فَإِذَا كَانُوا بِبَيْدَاءَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يُخْصَفُ بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخِرِهِمْ So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, this army will try to attack the Kaaba, and when they reach an open area outside the area of the Kaaba, while they're there, before actually reaching the Kaaba, the earth will split and swallow all of them. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, that I said to the Prophet, when I heard this from the Prophet ﷺ, I said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, كَيْفَ يُخْصَفُ بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخِرِهِمْ وَفِيهِمْ أَسْوَاقُهُمْ وَمَنْ لَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ She said, how is it possible that all of them are going to be destroyed? While amongst them are people who have nothing to do with these evil intentions. There are people who are just coming along with them. Some people that might have been brought by force with the army, whether they're slaves or servants. Maybe there are people that are just there to buy and sell and, and, and make money off the, the, the army. They're, they have nothing to do with you know, the intention of this evil army that is trying to invade and attack the Kaaba. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, يُخْصَفُ بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخِرِهِمْ ثُمَّ يُبْعَثُونَ عَلَى نِيَّاتِهِمْ All of them will be destroyed from the beginning to the first to the last of them. But when they're resurrected, they'll be resurrected based on their intentions. Those who had evil intentions, they'll be dealt with accordingly. And those who had no evil intentions, then they'll be dealt with accordingly. So this particular um, incident is something that will happen towards the end of time. The Prophet Sallallahu from the, uh, his special characteristics, is that he would mention things that will happen in the future. Of course, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala informed him of this. Okay. Now, this particular um, army is not the army of Abraha that the Quran mentions, because there was an army that attempted to invade the Kaaba and they were destroyed. As Allah mentions in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fil. So it's not that army. And it's also not the army that's at the end of time, as the hadith mentioned, that will actually reach the Kaaba and take it apart brick by brick, brick, which is from the things that will happen towards the end of time. But it's another one that will happen. What are their details? Allah alam, but the Prophet said it will be hap- it will happen, and that attempt will take place, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy them. Tayyib? So from the, 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 the mahalu shahid, the specific point of this hadith here is the portion where the Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ يُبْعَثُونَ عَلَى نِيَّاتِهِمْ As we go through the hadiths, we need to know what's the relationship between the hadith and the chapter heading itself. So the relationship is, the Prophet ﷺ is saying that these people will be resurrected based on their intentions. And from the benefit of this hadith is that when circumstances happen, for example, when there's natural disasters or things happen where a large group of people die at the same time, and everybody in the group is not the same. Some people are people of Iman and some people are not. And people are at different levels. People will be resurrected and they will be held accountable based on their reality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He says about Himself in the Quran, لا يظلم ربك أحدا. Allah will never commit injustice. طيب? So that's the purpose, the, the, the maqsood of that hadith there is that portion. ثُمَّ يُبْعَثُونَ عَلَى نِيَّاتِهِمْ and there's many other benefits from amongst them is um, how being around people of, يعني, of evil and them being destroyed يعني, is a negative thing. Even though a person might be a person of khair in that particular circumstance, and obviously they'll be resurrected based on their hal, but being around them could be a means of also being destroyed. Lidalika, when, when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about these types of scenarios happening, Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, Anuhulik wa fina salihun. We will be destroyed, and there's people amongst us who are righteous. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, إِذَا كَثْرُ الْخَبَثِ Yes, if there's a lot of evil that is happening, then that might be a reason for yeah, any people to be punished. And from amongst the people that will be punished are those that, I mean, amongst the people that will be affected by that particular incident might be people of khair, but they will be resurrected based on their, based on their, based on their, on their good condition that they're in. And those who are upon evil, then based on their, based on their intentions. طيب. And also just another side point before we continue. Uh, and this is, this is a point of reflection about the importance of understanding 
the Quran and the Sunnah correctly, the way it's supposed to be understood. You have some people of misguidance who understood or implemented this hadith in a way that is incorrect. Where they would use this to justify killing a large group of people. And they would say afterwards, well everybody will be resurrected based on their niyyah. And that is a very, very misguided understanding. Because Aslan is not allowed for you to, to harm, spill blood and kill people to begin with. So, and, and it might be shocking for us to hear this, but there are people who actually justify killing large groups of people using narrations like this. Where they say, يُخْصَفُ بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخِرِهِمْ ثُمَّ يُتْبَعُونَ يُبْعَثُونَ عَلَى نِيَاتِهِمْ And that is batil. That is an incorrect understanding. And the fight that we take from that is, it's very important when we're looking at and assessing the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that we put everything in its proper place. And that requires knowledge and understanding. Right? It's not simply acceptable for anybody to open up the Qur'an and the Sunnah and then interpret it based on their own desires. It's very, it's very problematic. And people become misguided because of this. Where they try to use their own intellect to understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Rather, we're supposed to understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah the way those companions understood it. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali and those Sahaba. How they understood it is how we understand it as well. Does that make sense? Tayyib. Inshallah, we'll continue with the next hadith for the Shaykh. This hadith again is of Aish, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. She said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no hijra after the opening of Mecca. Fatih here is referring to the opening of Mecca. And to say conquest is not necessarily a correct translation because conquering something involves there being some type of a struggle. But there was no fight when it came to the opening of the city of Mecca. The, the people of Mecca, they, they submitted the city to the Prophet and the Prophet ﷺ came in and marched in alayhi salatu wasalam. So Fatih is referring to the opening طيب, of the city of Mecca. وَلَكِنْ جِهَادٌ وَنِيَّةٌ Rather what is left is jihad and niyyah, intention. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَإِذَا اسْتُنْفِرْتُمْ فَانْفِرُوا And if you are commanded to go into battle, then you go. And this hadith is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. And Al-Imam al nawi he said, the meaning of hijra, or the meaning of this hadith is لا هجرة من مكة لأنها صارت دار الإسلام. When Prophet Sallallahu is saying لا هجرة بعد الفتح, he's referring to the hijra of Mecca to Medina. طيب? Because the Muslims were commanded to migrate and move from Mecca to Medina. Some of them initially migrated to Al Habasha, right, Abyssinia, East Africa, and then later on the second hijra was of the companions of Prophet Sallallahu as well as the Messenger of Allah. Where they migrated to Al Medina. طيب? So they went from a place where at that time it was considered to be the land of the non Muslims to a place where now they were able to establish their Islam. Make sense? Once Mecca became Darul Islam, then that hijrah is closed. Right? That hijrah, that specific hijrah, is, is, is finished. But hijrah in general is still something that is open for a person to move from one place to, from a place where. They are unable to establish their Islam to a place where they're able to establish their Islam and to establish the Sha'ir and the rituals of Islam. That still exists until the end of time. Right? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned in another hadith that Hijrah does not end until Tawbah ends. And when is the end of Tawbah? When the sun rises from the west. The sun rising from the west is from the major signs of the last day. So once that happens after that, moment, after that point, there's no more Tawbah. There's no more Tawbah and there's no more Hijrah. Hijrah is done at that time. طيب. So this hadith is referring to um, that Hijrah. The initial Hijrah of the specific one from Mecca to Medina. But what is left is the other acts of worship like Jihad the Prophet ﷺ mentioned which is striving for the sake of Allah with the goal and the objective of the, the Kalima of Allah to be the uppermost. And also niyyah, the intention that everything is done, all of the actions, the righteous actions, whether it's jihad or the other a'mal, acts of worship, are all done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if it's done for other than Allah, it's not accepted. Okay? Tayyib. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَإِذَا اسْتُنْفِرْتُمْ فَانْفِرُوا And when you are commanded to go into battle, then you go into battle. Who is the one that gives the command for the Muslims to go into battle? Is the one who is in charge of the Muslims. Right? So we take from that that it's not simply a responsibility that the person takes upon himself and says, you know what? I'm going to decide to go and fight. It doesn't work that way. Right? Because Islam is a systematic religion. Does that make sense? Everything is about order. And the asal of the rule of going into al-jihad is that it is fard kifaya. Meaning it's an obligation that is done that if a group of people are establishing it, then it is not obligatory in everybody. Does that make sense? And there's a difference for lil faida when we're talking about something that is obligatory, wajib, that you have to do, then there are some things that are obligatory upon us individually. Right? That's called fardu ayn. It's individually compulsory on each and every one of us. Salah is fardu ayn. We all have to pray. But there are some acts of worship that are furud kifaiya, meaning if a group of people are doing it, then it is not obligatory on everybody. So an, an example of that is, for example, Salatul Janazah. If a janazah is being performed, is it obligatory for everybody to be at the janazah? No, it's not wajib. Right? So long as there is a group of people that are fulfilling that wajib, then it is not wajib on everybody else. But if it's not being performed at all, then everybody is equally sinful. Does that make sense? So that's the hukum of al-jihad. But from the times that it becomes wajib, is when the Imam of the Muslims tells the, or commands the Muslims or a group of Muslims to go into battle. Does that make sense? That's why Allah in the Quran says, Ya ayu ladina amanu, ma lakum idha qeer lakum fi sabirillahi. What's the ayah? Aha. Ma lakum la tunf. What is it? Say that one time. Idha qeer lakum infiru fi sabirillah. O you who believe, Allah says in Surah Tawbah, O you who believe, what is wrong with you? Why is it that when you are being told, to go forth into battle, right? You're not going into it, right? You're not going into it. Are you pleased of this in this of this worldly life over the afterlife, right? So when that when the Imam of the Muslims tells the people to go into, it, then then it becomes obligatory. Does that make sense? طيب. So the point of this hadith here is an niyyah. What remains is the niyyah. So again, that all of our actions that we do has to be based on niyyah. What is the niyyah? What is the intention? That it is done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب. Uh, hadith number four. Fadl Shaykh. This hadith is narrated by Abd, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari radiallahu anhu. Uh, Jabir, again, he's from the companions who narrated the most ahadith. There are seven, there are seven companions who are called Al Mukthirun, seven of them. Four of them are from the Muhajirun. طيب? And they are um, Aisha radiallahu anha, Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Abdullah ibn Umar. طيب? And the other three are from the Ansar, which are Jabir ibn Abdullah. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and Anas ibn Malik. Those seven, they are the ones who, are, who have narrated the most number of hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Jabir, he said, radiyallahu anhu, kunna ma'an nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi ghazatin. We were, with the Prophet, we were with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in an expedition. We went out for battle with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, inna bil madinati la rijalan ma sirtum masiran وَلَا قَطَعْتُمْ وَادِيًا إِلَّا كَانُوا مَعَكُمْ حَبَسَهُمُ الْمَرَضِ There are men that we left behind in the city of Medina. We have not passed by a valley or climbed over a hill, except that those companions we left behind were with you. What is it, what is it that left them behind? What, what is it that kept them behind though? The reason why they couldn't join us is because 
they were not feeling well, they were sick. What do we mean that they're with you? They're with, they have the same reward that you have. You are here marching and going all this way and putting in all this effort. And those companions who were left behind in Medina who could not make it because of a legitimate excuse or a legitimate reason, they are back home but they have the same reward you have. So what is, what, is it that, what is it that made them at the same level as these companions in terms of the reward? Is their intention. They had the pure intention of wanting to be there with them, but because of a legitimate reason, in this case, they were not feeling well, and what held them back was they were not feeling well, then they get the complete ajr because of their, their intention. And that's the riwayah. Uh, Naam, that's, that's one riwayah. Another, another narration mentions, Prophet ﷺ said, إِلَّا شَرَكُوكُمْ فِي الْأَجْرِ you guys did not pass by any valley and go up any hill except that they are sharing the reward with you. They are equal with you guys in the reward that you are receiving. And Imam al-Bukhari's narration in his, in his book, the narration which is narrated by another companion, Anas ibn Malik, who we mentioned is from the seven who narrated the most ahadith. And Anas ibn Malik was, uh, his kunya was Abu Hamza, radiyallahu an, and he was the khadim of the Prophet He was the servant of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made Hijrah to Al Medina, the mother of Anas came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Anas and he was 10 years old at the time. Anas was 10 years old. And he told the Prophet, she told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I want Anas to stay with you and to serve you. And Anas served the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 10 years. The 10 years of the Messenger of Allah being in Al Medina, he was always with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And we see as Anas reports about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there was never a time the Prophet ﷺ, you know, became angry with me or yelled at me or became upset with me in terms of how he was with the Prophet ﷺ, how the Prophet ﷺ was with Anas. And we will see other narrations where Anas is saying, I was with the Prophet ﷺ, I was walking with him, I was spending time with him. He's a child, 10 years old, 12 years old, a teenager. But you see the Prophet ﷺ, you know, looking over him and taking care of him, radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for Anas. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him a long life and many children. And he lived a very long life. He was actually from the last of the companions to pass away, radiallahu anhu. He lived to be over 100 years old. And he had many, his children, his grandchildren combined were over 100 as well. Allah blessed him with many children and a long life. And he became very wealthy as well, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Anas, he said in this narration, رَجَعْنَا مِنْ غَزْوَةِ تَبُوكِ We came back from the battle of Tabuk. So he was with the Prophet sallallahu in the battle of Tabuk. He said, we came back with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu then said, when we were coming back from Tabuk, The Prophet Sallam He said that we left behind a group of men in Medina that we did not pass by any area, any village, any hill, any valley, except that they were with us in terms of their reward. But what kept them back was they had a legitimate reason. So this, this hadith is, uh, the, the shahid is the intention was what caused them to have this tremendous reward. Right? And this applies to any act of worship. That if a person is one who consistently does an ibadah, but at any point of time they were unable to fulfill that ibadah the way they would normally do it because of a legitimate reason, and they intended to do so if they didn't have that reason, then they'll get the full reward. Right? So a person constantly prays salah in jama'ah, but there might be a time where, for example, they can't make it to jama'ah because they're not feeling well. Right? Or they have a legitimate reason that prevented them from coming to the masjid to pray in jama'ah, they will get the full reward because they intended to be there. Right? We mentioned an example before of all of us being prevented from coming to the masjid during the, during the lockdown. There were people who were normally consistent in praying their five daily prayers in jama'ah. Tayyip, or whatever prayer they, they, they were consistent in prayers in the masjid. But now they're prevented because of the pandemic, lockdown. Or they're sick. They, they got fever or they have some, you know, um, what is it called? Symptoms of, of the COVID and they can't come to the masjid. Because they might harm the other people. But the intention was to be at the masjid. They'll stay home, but they'll get their full reward. Does that make sense? So that shows the significance and the importance of the niyyah that is sincere. And we get that from this particular hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tayyib. Naam, Shaykh.
This hadith was narrated by Ma'an ibn Yazid ibn Akhnas radiyallahu anhum. And al-Imam al-Nawwi, he says that huwa wa abuhu wa jadduhu sahabiyun. Him, yani Ma'an, and his father Yazid, and his grandfather Akhnas, all three of them were companions of the Prophet sallallahu And what does it mean to be a sahabi? The definition of a companion is a person who met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while believing in the message of the Prophet ﷺ, and they died upon Islam. That is the definition of a companion. طيب? So all of them were companions. The son, the, uh, Ma'an, his father, and his grandfather. Radiallahu anhum. So he said, Ma'an is saying here, that, Kana Abi Yazid, yani his father, uh, yani Kana Abi, my father, Yazid, akhraja dananira, yatasaddaqu biha, فَوَضَعَ عِنْدَ رَجُلٍ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ So his father, Yazid, donated some dinanir. Dinar are gold coins. The currency of the past, they used to use dinars and dirhams. So dinar is a gold coin. right? And uh, dirhams are silver coins. Okay? So when you hear dinar, it's gold coins. Okay? And it's actual pure gold. Okay? So his father donated some gold coins and he wanted to donate it. So he gave it to a man in the masjid to give it to somebody in need on his behalf. So he went to the masjid and he said, I have this money, I want to give it in charity. He gave it to somebody to be responsible on their behalf to give it to somebody in need. Make sense? Uh, naam. So, كان أبي يزيد أخرج دنانير يتصدق بها. So he wanted to, he, he had... Uh, dinars that he wanted to donate so فَوَضْعَهَا عِنْدَ رَجُلٍ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ he gave it to a man in the masjid to give it out in charity that was the, that was the point so Ma'an he then said فَجِئْتُ فَأَخَذْتُهَا so I went to that man Ma'an is saying this I went to the man who got the money from his father and he took the money for himself so what we understand is he was in need Ma'an himself was in need of money he was somebody that was not well off. So he saw a person giving money out in charity and he he was yani, rightfully so deserving to get that, that charity and he got the charity and he came back with the charity home. Okay? So when he came home to his father and his father saw what happened, his father then said to his son, Wallahi ma iyak arat. I swear by Allah, I did not mean this money to be going to you. I wanted this money to go to someone else. Okay? فَخَاصَمْتُهُ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So Ma'an said, I went to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to plead my case. Because now the father and the son are, the father is saying, this money is not supposed to be for you. And the son is saying, I deserve this money. So they both went to the Prophet وسلم, with this case to solve this issue. What do we do? So the Prophet وسلم, he then said, لَكَ مَا نَوَيْتَ يَا يَزِيدِ وَلَكَ مَا أَخَذْتَ يَا مَعَنْ He said, you, O Yazid, you get the reward for what you intended, meaning your intention was to give this money out to a poor person, and you got your reward. وَلَكَ مَا أَخَذْتَ يَا مَعَنْ And you, Ma'an, you keep what you received. Okay, and this hadith is narrated by Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. So the, the, the shahid of this hadith is the portion where the Prophet ﷺ said, لَكَ مَا نَوَيْتَ يَا Yazid. You will receive the reward based on your intention. Your intention was to give this money out in charity and you did and you get the reward for it as for your son he deserves to get that because he qualifies for it so he will receive it okay so from the benefits of this hadith first of all we understand from the context of this story that this charity that was given out by Yazid is sadaqah that is voluntary and why is that the case because if it was zakah it would not be allowed for him to give zakah to his own children because his children are supposed to aslan be getting his nafaqah. He's supposed to already pay for 
his children. But if it's charity, there's no problem. If it's voluntary charity, you can give it to your children or your family members that you're responsible for. But you cannot say, I'm paying my obligatory zakah and you give it to your, your children or your those because those are aslan, your, they're your responsibility to begin with. They don't come under the zakah that you're supposed to, that you're supposed to pay. Right? So from the benefits we take from this hadith is also the permissibility of you telling somebody to give your charity on your behalf. Right? You can tell somebody to give your sadaqah on your behalf. Right? Whether it's a person or organization or somebody who's responsible and will take the responsibility and fulfill that responsibility, there's no problem. Because we understand from this hadith, that's what this companion did. He gave it to a person to give it out to somebody who is, who is in need. But the, the maqsood of this hadith or the, the point of uh, the shahid is where the Prophet ﷺ said, you will get the niyyah, the intention based on the, uh, the donation that you gave. Tayyib. Fadl Shaykh. This hadith is narrated by Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu. And as I said last week, sometimes an imam know we in this book, when he comes across a companion who is from the prominent companions, he'll mention their whole lineage, or most of it. So here he mentioned the, his kuni Abu Ishaq, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, okay? Uh, na'am, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, and the name of Abi Waqqas is Malik. So his name is Sa'd ibn Malik. His name is Sa'd ibn Malik, but he's famously known as Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Abi Waqqas is the kunya of his father. Tayyib. Sa'd ibn Malik ibn Uhayb ibn Abdul Manaf ibn Zuhrah. So he's from Bani Zuhrah. Radiyallahu anhu. And that is the maternal family of the Prophet Sallallahu Because the Prophet Sallallahu mother Amina was also from Bani Zuhrah. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu used to refer to Sa'd as he is my maternal uncle. He is my maternal uncle. Tayyib. And Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, as Imam al nawi mentioned here, Ahad al-Ashra al-Mashhood lahum bil-Jannah. He's from the ten companions that were promised Jannah. And this is a special group of ten companions who are known as the ten companions that were promised al-Jannah. Right? They're not the only companions that were promised Jannah, by the way, because there are many other companions who also promised Jannah. But the reason why they're called the ten companions promised Jannah is because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned all ten of them by name at one time. Abu Bakr, fi, the Prophet ﷺ said it with them, each one by their name. Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah, right? Those four and the remaining six, which was Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Zubair ibn Awam, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Sa'id ibn Zayd, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, and Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn Jarrah. Radiyallahu anhum. Ajma'in. Those are known as the ten companions promised Jannah. But there are other companions who are promised Jannah too. We see this in the narrations. For example, Khadija radiallahu anha. Right? We know the hadith where when Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallam, and she walked in and Jibreel told the Prophet sallam, let her know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you salams and has promised for you a house in paradise 
that has no noise and no stress and right so this is an indication that she is mashhud bil jannah right as well as the other wives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the for example the uh, the, uh, the other companion um um thabit ibn qais i think his name was naam ibn shamas okay so he was from the companions prophet sallallahu mentioned that he's from the people of jannah and there are many other companions as well but these ones are known as the 10 who are promised paradise طيب? And they're considered to be the best of the Sahaba. Of course, the best of them being Abu Bakr, and then Umar, and then Uthman, and then Ali. Then the remaining six, then the companions of Badr, wahakada. Their companions are in levels in terms of their virtue. Okay? So Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqas, he's narrated in this hadith, and he said, radiyallahu anhu, Ja'ani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, ya'uduni aama hajjatil wada'a. The Prophet ﷺ came to visit me while I was sick in the year of the final pilgrimage or the farewell pilgrimage. Okay? Ya'uduni. And, and, and al-fa'idah, there's a difference between iyada and ziyara. Right? They're both visiting, but when you say iyada, it means what is understood is you're visiting someone who's sick, somebody who's not feeling well. While ziyara is a general visitation, it could be that you're visiting a person who's sick. But when you, when you say iyada is specific for somebody who is sick. So he said, Ya'uduni, he is visiting me because he was sick. Radiallahu anhu, min waja'in ishtaddabi, from an illness that became more severe. So he was severely ill, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this is in Mecca, right? In the year of the Prophet's final hajj. So Sa'ad, he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, إِنِّي قَدْ بَلَغَ بِي مِنَ الْوَجَعِ مَا تَرَى I have reached this level in my illness, as you can see, I'm really, really ill. وَأَنَا ذُو مَالٍ And I have a lot of money. Sa'ad is very wealthy, رضي الله تعالى عنه. And I have a lot of money. وَلَا يَرِثُنِي إِلَّا بْنَةٌ لِي And nobody is going to inherit my wealth except for one daughter that I have. I only have one daughter, and she will be from my, my waratha, my inheritors. أَفَأَتَصَدَّقُ بِثُلُثَيْ مَالِي O Messenger of Allah, should I give two-thirds of my wealth in charity? Right? That's a lot of money. Two-thirds of the wealth. So the Prophet ﷺ, he told him, La. No, do not give that much money in charity. And then he said, Fashatru ya Rasulullah, how about half of my wealth? And the Prophet ﷺ said, La. No. Then he said, Fathurthu ya Rasulullah, what about a third of my wealth? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, "Athuluthu wa thuluthu kafir." Wa fi riwaya kabir. He said, "No problem to give a third, but even a third is a lot. Even a third is a large amount." And then the Prophet ﷺ said to Sa'ad, "Innaka an tadra warathataka aghniya khayrun min an tadrahum alatan yatakaffafun al-nas." It is better for you to leave money and wealth behind for your family and to leave your family behind wealthy, then to leave them with nothing, and as a result, they'll go and ask people and beg people. You're better off leaving off a large amount of money for your family, so that they don't have to rely on other people. Okay? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is a shahid of the hadith, by the way, he said, and... There is not a charity that you will give, or there's not, a, there's not wealth that you'll give out in charity, and you're doing so with the intention of sincerely pleasing Allah wa ta'ala alone, except that you will be rewarded for it. Even if it means putting some food in the mouth of your wife. Even if you're doing that with the intention of pleasing Allah wa ta'ala, you'll get your reward for that. حَتَّى مَا تَجْعَلْ فِي فِي امرأتك. طيب By the way, um, here it's the hadith mentions فِي فِي امرأتك. So there's, it says فِي twice. And the first فِي is, is, is a حرف جر. Right? And the second فِي is a noun. So one is an article and one is a noun. The word فِي here is referring to, the noun is the mouth. Okay? So, and the other one is in. So it's, as, even if you're putting food in, or putting it in the mouth of your uh, your wife. Sometimes you have some prince that will put the second the, the mouth 
with a shadda. So they'll say fi ye, which is which is not correct. It's the, it's actually fi. Okay? In this case, in, in this in, in this in this context. طيب. Continuing the Prophet وسلم, sorry, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas he then said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah. أُخَلَّفُ بعد أَصْحَابِي Will I be left behind? Okay, will I pass away before my friends, before my companions? Then the Prophet because he was very sick, he was asking, would I, would I die in this state? Would I, is this the end for me? Or am I going to live longer like my other companions? So what is Sa'ad worried about? He's worried about several things. The most important thing he's worried about is passing away in Mecca. Why? Mecca is the greatest city. In the world, in terms of its reward, but here it's because the companions who made hijrah from Mecca to Medina, they did not like for them to pass away in the place where they made hijrah from. So he was worried that him being in this state, that he might pass away in Mecca. Although Mecca is a virtuous city, no doubt, but because they were from the Muhajirun, they did not want to. They wanted their hijrah to be complete. By being somewhere else from, and rather not being in the place where coming back to where they initially left. Does that make sense? So that was the way that Sa'ad had asking the Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet then said to Sa'ad, radiallahu anhu, he said, Inna, uh, he, he said, Inna ka lan tukhallaf fata'amala amalan tabtaghi bihi wajh Allah illa zdatta bihi darajatan wa rif'a. Okay? So the Prophet then he said that you will not, left, you will not be left behind. Because the other worry he had was, if I'm left behind, my, the other companions will go ahead of me in terms of reward and ajr, in terms of actions, amal. So once a person dies, there's no more reward that they can potentially do. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you will, you will stay, you will, you will be okay. And you will be able to do actions that you're doing sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you do that, you will be elevated for each level. Yani you will you'll be elevated in status because of the actions that you do. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَلَعَلَّكَ أَن تُخَلَّفْ حَتَّى يَنْتَفِعَ بِكَ أَقْوَامٌ وَيَضُرَّ بِكَ آخَرُونَ He said, and it might be so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will spare you, and you will stay, and you will be of benefit to people of khair, and you will be also, you will be a source of harm to others, referring to the enemies, which actually happened. Because Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, later on, he, 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 he lived radiallahu anhu, he, did, he, he lived longer, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he ended up being from the appointed governors in the khilaf of Umar bin Khattab. So he became a source of khair and benefit for the other Muslims, let alone being an advisor to Umar radiallahu anhu, and to Abu Bakr Siddiq as well, in his khilafah. And he also was from those who brought problems to the enemy in the battlefield, right? During the khilaf of Umar bin Khattab, he was the one who was leading the army in Al-Iraq. The battles against Furus and, for example, Qadisi and some of the battles that happened in Persia, Sa'ad was the companion who was leading the army, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Tayyip? So he was from that, he was also, as Prophet ﷺ mentioned and prophesied, that he will cause problems for others, referring to the enemies of, of Islam. Tayyip. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allahu, he made a dua and he said, Allahumma amdi li ashabi hijratahum. Oh Allah, allow my companions to complete and finish their hijrah. Right, so that, that du'a includes them not passing away in, in, in Mecca. وَلَا تَرُدَّهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِهِمْ And oh Allah, do not allow them to turn on their heels. Keep them firm on the haqq. لَكِنْ The Prophet ﷺ then said, لَكِنْ الْبَائِسُ The one that is unfortunate is Sa'ad ibn Khawla. That's another companion, رضي الله عنه. Sa'ad ibn Khawla, the Prophet ﷺ said, he's unfortunate. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, يعني, Sa'ad is saying, يَرْثِ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet ﷺ is feeling remorse for him that he died in Mecca. طيب. Sa'ad ibn Khawla was from the companions who made hijrah as well, radiallahu anhu, from Mecca to Medina, radiallahu anhu, and he is from Ashabu Badr. He was from the companions that fought in the battle of Badr. So he's very, he is from the يعني, companions who have a high status. But the Prophet ﷺ feels bad for him, why? Because he died in Mecca. Right? He died in Mecca. So that, that was the way that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas had. So the Prophet ﷺ, and from the fawaid of this hadith is, he's consoling Sa'ad. He's telling Sa'ad, don't worry, your situation won't be like Sa'ad ibn Khawla radiallahu anhu. You'll be okay, you, you will live to complete your hijrah. 
Right? That does not mean this companion who passed away in Mecca is a person who is bad. لا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. He is somebody who is from the Sahaba, and he is from the Ashabu Badr رضي الله تعالى عنه. But some things are the fadl of Allah يؤتيه من يشاء. So he didn't get this particular virtue of completing his hijrah. رضي الله تعالى عنه. In any case, the shahid of this hadith, it's a long hadith, but the shahid is that portion where the Prophet Sallam told Sa'ad that any action that you do, in this case the nafaqa that you give, the charity that you give, if you do so sincerely for Allah, you will be rewarded for it. So any action that we do sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll get the reward for it. Right? Even if it's something as simple as feeding your wife, or feeding your children, or taking care of your children, or helping those in need. If your, since, if your intention is to sincerely do it to please Allah, Allah will reward you for, you for it. Right? You clean the neighborhood. You sweep outside. You shovel the snow of your neighbor. Right? You're cleaning your driveway. You clean the driveway of your neighbor as well. And you're doing so for Allah's sake. You're not looking for you know, some type of uh, praise or brownie points from your neighbor. You know, you're doing it to please Allah wa ta'ala. And you'll get the ajr for it, inshaAllah. Tayyip? Naam, Shaykh, fadl. Right, this hadith is narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. His name, there's a, diff, there's a large difference of opinion actually as to the actual name of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. But many of the scholars, including Al Imam al Nawi, they have the opinion that his name was Abdurrahman ibn Sakhr al Dawsi radiallahu anhu. He narrated this hadith and he said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Inna Allah la yanduru ila ajsamikum. Allah does not look at your bodies, your physical nature. وَلَا إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ And how you look, right? Your image, your appearance. وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks in your, into your hearts. And there's another narration that also mentions وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ as well. Right? right? This is the riwayah in Muslim. And there's other narrations that mention both. قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ Your hearts and your actions. Very important hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? And this again, the shahid here, the point of this hadith mentioned in this chapter is your heart. What's, refer, what's being referred to your heart is your intention. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes into account your niyyah in all of your actions, in, in, in everything that you do. And also takes into account your a'mal and if they're done correctly. Right? So both of them have to be there. Like I said earlier, for an action to be accepted, it has to be done, number one, sincerely for Allah's sake alone. And it has to be done correctly. It has to be done correctly according to the Sunnah of the Prophet. So, what is important is our hearts and that our intentions are pure and sincere and that our actions are correct and upright. And how we look is simply not enough. Right? The appearance that we put out is, is not enough. Does that mean that we ignore the, the importance of you know, looking good? No, it does, not, it does not mean that oh, Allah does not look, take into account my appearance so I'm not going to appear properly. No, it doesn't mean that. Right? Because we have other hadith of the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the importance of looking good. In Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Right? But in that hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning that you know, looking good is important, why did the Prophet ﷺ mention that? Because he told the companions that you will not enter Jannah even if you have a small amount of arrogance in your heart. So the companions, when they heard that, one of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, are you saying that a person wears nice clothes or has a nice, yani has nice shoes, does that mean that they're not going to enter Jannah? Right? You have a nice car, you have a nice home. No, no, that's not what the Prophet is talking about. He said, Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. But arrogance is when you ignore or you reject the truth and you put people down. The point here is, Allah does not look at your... Your, your, your body, or how you look, right? فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ right? That ayah is referring to the disbelievers, right? They see, but they are, they have no heart, right? So for them, they might look strong, they might 
appear everything is good, but because there's nothing, they're blind when it comes to their heart, there's it's not of any fa'id of any benefit. So it's important that the Muslim rectifies his heart. He works on his heart. How? By being sincere in all of the actions that we do. Inna Allah la yanburu ila ajsamikum. Allah will not look at your physical nature or your bodies. That's not what is important in, in terms of your actions being accepted. But your actions have to be correct and your intention has to be sincere. Tayyib. Fadl Shaykh. This hadith is narrated by the companion named Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu. His name was Abdullah ibn Qais. Abu Musa radiyallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu was asked a question. Somebody asked the Prophet sallam the question. And the question is about a person who fights. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi He's fighting, but the reason for, his, for him engaging in al-jihad is what? Yuqatilu shaja'atan. He is fighting so that he can, it can be said about him that he is... He's brave. Or he's fighting because for a cause, for a cause, whether it's for his tribe or for his nation or whatever, whatever other reason he might be fighting for. Right? <coughs> or he's fighting to show off. يُقَاتِلُ riyan, Right? So the Prophet ﷺ was asked, أَيُّ ذَلِكَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Which of these conditions are this person is doing it for the sake of Allah? Then the Prophet ﷺ, he answered by giving a general principle. He said, مَنْ قَاتَلَ لِتَكُونَ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلِيَا فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Whoever engages in this ibadah and is doing so for the sake of the kalima of Allah to be uppermost, that is the one who is doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this hadith is indicating that the person who is engaging in al-jihad for all these other causes other than for the sake of Allah, it's not accepted. Right? And there are many, many examples we see in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet ﷺ would mention that that person, he is in the hellfire. Why? Because he, was in, he died and why he was doing this, this act of jihad was not for Allah's sake. He was doing it to show off. So other people can say that it was he is brave. Or other people can say that he, you know, he was, he was you know, fierce in the battlefield. So again, the shahid of the hadith is the intention. If you're doing it for the sake of Allah, it will be accepted. Anything other than the sake of Allah, it will be rejected. Now, Fadl Shaykh. This, this hadith was narrated by the companion Abu Abi Bakrah radiyallahu anhu al thaqafi His name was Nufa' ibn al-Harith radiyallahu anhu. He said that the Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا الْتَقَ الْمُسْلِمَانِ بِسَيْفَيْهِمَا If two Muslims are fighting each other, right? And their swords meet, or they're fighting each other, right? In the battlefield, the Prophet sallallahu said, فَالْقَاتِلُ وَالْمَقْتُولُ فِي النَّارِ The one who killed and the one who's killed are both in the hellfire. Both of them are in the hellfire. So the companions, so Afwan, so uh, Abu Bakr, he said, Ya Rasulullah, هذا القاتل فما بار المقتول He said, we understand the, the killer, the one who engaged in killing his fellow Muslim. But what about the one who, who was killed? Why is he in the hellfire? So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إنه كان حريصا على قتل صاحبه Because he was adamant, he, had, he, ha, he made the intention that he wanted to also get him. The only reason why he died is because the other guy beat him to it. Right? If he, he wanted to kill the other person as well. His intention was, I want to kill him as well. So the shahid of the hadith here, or, or, or being mentioned in this chapter, is the fact that he had the intention to also harm his fellow Muslim, even though it didn't ha- he didn't do the act of killing, but he's also punished the same way as the killer because his intention was to kill as well. Does that make sense? So that is the shahid of the hadith. And there's many fawaid from amongst them is the impermissibility of Muslims fighting each other. And that it is haram to spill the blood of the Muslim. 
it is haram. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in so many other hadith, the seriousness of spilling the blood of the Muslim. Right? And in other narrations, spilling the blood of those who do not deserve to be killed to begin with. Even from amongst those who are non-Muslims, but they're not fighting with you in, uh, in, in battle. Because the, by the lilfa'idah, the, the non-Muslims themselves are not all the same category. Right? There are, there are some that are considered to be in a state of war with the Muslims. And then there are others that are not. There are those that you have a ahd with. Right? You have a, you have a peace treaty with. Right? There are those who are in the, the non-Muslims that are in the land of the Muslims, but they're there by permission. They're there on contract. They're there on a visa. They're there because they're living there. Or vice versa. The Muslim is in the land of the non-Muslim and he's there on a, on a visa or he's, he's a citizen of the country. Then you can't simply go on the street and start you know, killing people because they're not Muslim. It's not allowed. Right? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, whoever kills a mu'ahid, he will never smell the the reeh of al-jannah. Right? A non-Muslim, but you are in a contract with him. And you simply kill them because you think it's allowed to do so, that person will never enter jannah. Tayyip? And there's nothing wrong with a Muslim dealing with a non-Muslim that is, that is, yani they are at peace with in a way that is just. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين. Allah said, Allah does not prevent you when it comes to dealing with the non-Muslims that are not fighting with you, they're not at war with you, and they haven't kicked you out of your homes for you to be good to them, right? And to be just in dealing with them. The point is, with the Muslim, min babi awla, you're not supposed to spill the blood of a Muslim. Right? So there are two things that keeps a person's blood sacred. Iman and aman. Iman is the person is a mu'min. If they're a mu'min, their blood is haram. And the second one is aman. They are safe. Whether it's because of a ahd or whatever it might be. All of the different details that Islam tells us in terms of when a person is safe. Does that make sense? And this is ref- the aman is referring to the non-Muslim, of course. Tayyip? So this hadith is very, very important in emphasizing that point. But the shahid is that this other person who was killed, he was punished the same way as the murderer because his intention was also to murder the other person. Is that wadah? Tayyip, clear. Next hadith, Shaykh. <laughs> This hadith is narrated also by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Salatul Rajuli fi jama'atin. A person's salah, when they pray in jama'ah, is, يعني, is greater, right? Is, is increased. It's more than a person's salah at home or anywhere else in the marketplace by bid'an wa ishreena daraja. Right? 20 something levels. So this hadith mentions bid'an wa ishreen. There's another narration that mentions 25. There's another narration that mentions 27. And all are authentic. Right? The point is, that is how much more virtuous praying salah in jama'ah is than praying by yourself at home or praying by yourself anywhere else. Okay? And then what the Prophet said, وَذَلِكَ أَنَّ أَحَدَهُمْ إِذَا تَوَضَّعَ And this is when a person makes wudu at home. فَأَحْسَنَ الْوُضُوء And he does his wudu properly. ثم أتى المسجد. Then he comes to the masjid. لا ينهزه لا ينهزه إلا الصلاة. يعني his intention, the reason why he's coming to the masjid is for prayer. He's not. He doesn't have any other ulterior motives. And that's the shahid that the person is coming for the sake of praying in the masjid, right? 
it's not that he's just stopping by and right. He's, yes, the person who stops by, he's 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 he's, he's working or he's driving, is going somewhere, and he, and salah comes in and he stops by. Yes, they get virtue of praying in the masjid, but then there's an added virtue of the person who left their home and their intention was to come to the masjid for salah, right? Their intention is more. Why? Because their intention, the reward is more because their intention is more pure. And we mentioned that the purer the intention is, the more reward a person gets. Okay? So this person left their home and they're coming to the masjid. لا يريد إلا الصلاة The reason why they're coming is for the sake of prayer. Right? They're not leaving their house, going to Walmart, doing some shopping, and then, oh, it's salah, I'm going to you know, stop by the masjid. Yes, you're doing the right thing, but is that person's reward? Yes, they get the reward, but it's not the same as the person who already pre-planned it and was at home and he made wudu properly and, and he came to the masjid and they're not the same. Not the same. Even though they both get their reward, but this one gets more reward because of his niyyah. Okay? And the effort that he put in. طيب. The Prophet ﷺ then said, for that individual, لَمْ يَخُدْ خُطْوَةً إِلَّا رُفِعَ لَهُ بِهَا دَرَجَةً That person will not, he'll take every step that he will take, come into the masjid, what will happen with every step? He will be, يعني, raised a level. وَخُطَّ عَنْهُ بِهَا خَطِيئًا And a sin will be wiped away from him. For every step that he takes to the masjid. حَتَّى يَدْخُلَ الْمَسْجِدِ Until he enters into the masjid. فَإِذَا دَخَلَ الْمَسْجِدِ And if he enters into the mosque, once he's inside the masjid, كَانَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ مَا كَانَتِ الصَّلَاةُ هِيَ تَحْبِسُهُ So long as he's in the masjid because he's there to pray, then he is in a state of ibadah and salah. And that reward is continuing for him. So you come in the masjid, you sit down, you're waiting for salah, the reward is continuing for you. You pray the salah, you get the reward of your prayer, which is 27 times more than praying at home. You stay in the masjid after the salah in the place where you prayed, and you're making tasbih, or you're reading Quran, or you're listening to something, you, the reward is continuing for you. Prophet he said, right? فَإِذَا دَخَلَ الْمَسْجِدْ كَانَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ مَا كَانَتِ الصَّلَاةُ هِيَ تَحْبِسُهُ So long as what's holding him back is salah, then he is, the reward is continuing for him. وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَيْهِ And the angels are also there making dua for the person. Okay? And what are the angels saying, the dua they're making on that person? So long as the person, مَا دَامَ فِي مَجْلِسِهِ الَّذِي صَلَّى فِيهِ He stays in the place where he was praying, the angels are continuing to make dua for that person. And the angels are saying, اللَّهُمَّ ارْحَمْهُ Oh Allah, have mercy on this person. اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لَهُ Oh Allah, forgive them. Allahumma tub alayhi, O Allah, accept their repentance. Ma lam yu'di fihi. So long as a person is in that state and he does not harm others. Harm others by how? He begins, for example, backbiting or doing other things that are, that are wrong while sitting in the masjid. Once that happens, the dua of the angels end. Or, ma lam yuhdith fihi. Or if he does not break his wudu. If he's in the state of wudu, that dua continues for him. But once his wudu is broken and he has to leave, then that ends. Father? So this, and then the Prophet ﷺ continues and he says, نعم, متفق عليه. The hadith hands there, Bukhari and Muslim. So the, the shahid of the, of the hadith, the point of it being mentioned in this chapter, is the person sincerely leaves their home to come to the masjid for that sake of praying salah. If they're sincerely doing that for Allah's sake, look at all the reward they get. Every step they take, they are elevated, they get a good deed. And an evil deed is wiped away. And when they enter into the masjid, so long as they're staying, they pray in the masjid, they get the reward of praying 27 times more than the salah they will pray by themselves. The salah that you pray at home, the one that you pray in the masjid, sorry, is 27 times more or better than the one that you will pray by yourself. Okay? So not only that, but you have the angels making dua for you, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have rahmah on you, to, to accept your repentance, to pardon you and to forgive you. So all of this is from the virtues of you being sincere and coming to the masjid and establishing the, the salah. So this is a tremendous hadith and it's establishing the, the, the importance of having sincerity and the virtue of coming and praying salah in the masjid in jama'ah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us and allow us to be from those. Tayyib. Naam, Shaykh, next hadith. <laughs>
This hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And he is the cousin of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. So he's the first cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is from, like I mentioned earlier, from the companions who narrated many ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was also special because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him understanding of this deen and to give him understanding of the Qur'an. Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa allimhu ta'wil. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made dua and he said, Oh Allah, give him understanding of the deen and also give him understanding of the Qur'an. Idhalika, he was from the most knowledgeable of the companions in the Qur'an. Even though when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he, it is said that he was about 13 or 14 years old. Radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. So he was very young in age. Radiyallahu anhu. But he was known to be from the most knowledgeable, amongst the most knowledgeable of the companions in the Qur'an. طيب? And there's many virtues about Abdullah ibn Abbas. May Allah be pleased with him and his father. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي مَا يَرْوِي عَنْ رَبِّهِ So this is, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, and it is a narration from Allah. So this hadith is called Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi is a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is narrating, the hadith, narrating a statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is not Qur'an. Okay? So it is the kalam of Allah, it's a speech of Allah, but it's not Qur'an. It's different than Qur'an. And from the distinctions between Qur'an and Hadith Qudsi is obviously the Qur'an is muta'abbad bi tilawatihi. We worship Allah by reading the Qur'an. In the salah that we pray, for example, we read the Qur'an. But we can't read Hadith Qudsi in salah. Okay? For example, the one who reads the Qur'an, there's a special reward for Qur'an. Every letter that you recite, you get 10 reward. That doesn't apply to Hadith Qudsi. But the Hadith Qudsi in summary is when the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and he's narrating from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? So this is an example of that. So he's, he's narrating from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who Allah said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ الْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيِّئَاتِ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records the good deeds and the bad deeds. Al-hasanat was-sayyat. The bad deeds that we do are recorded and the good deeds that we do are recorded. ثُمَّ بَيَّنَ ذَلِكَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining it further. Look, look at this now. فَمَنْ هَمَّ بِحَسَنَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا كَتَبَهَ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى عِنْدَهُ حَسَنَةً كَامِلًا Whoever intends, they make the intention of doing a good deed, but they did not do the good deed. A person intended to do a good deed, but they did not do the good deed. It will be recorded for them by Allah, the, in, the complete reward. They'll get a full reward, a full good deed. Even though they didn't do it. They only had the niyyah, but they didn't do it. Okay, what if the person did, had the niyyah to do the good deed and they actually did the action? The Prophet, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that Allah said, وَإِنْ هَمَّ بِهَا If he actually had the intention of doing the good deed, right? فَعَمِلَهَا And he actually acted upon it, he did it. كَتَبَهَ اللَّهُ عَشْرَ حَسَنَاتٍ إِلَىٰ سَبْعِمِيَةِ ضِعْفٍ إِلَىٰ أَضْعَافٍ كَثِيرًا It will be recorded in the person's skill, uh, books of good deeds, that they did that, it will be multiplied by 10. Minimum. By 10. Or it could be multiplied up to 700 times. Or even more. Okay? So, just a quick pause there. So here we know, the Prophet is telling us that Allah is telling us, this is what Allah is saying this, that if you do a good deed, if you intend to do a good deed and you do it, then that deed will be multiplied by 10. That's automatic. Any good deed that we do is automatically double, is multiplied by how much? 10. That's the minimum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might multiply it for you from, by, by more. 700 times or even more. That's, the, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah upon his servant. Okay? But if the person intended to do a good deed and didn't do it, then they get one reward. Okay. Then the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِنْ هَمَّ بِسَيِّئَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا If a person now had the intention of doing an evil deed, a sin, and they did not do the sin, كَتَبَهَ اللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حَسَنَةً كَامِلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will record for that person that they get a full reward. They had the intention of doing a sin, but they did not do it. They get rewarded for that. Okay? And, وَإِنْ هَمَّ بِهَا فَعَمِلَهَا Then if they intended to do a bad deed, and they did the bad deed, then كَتَبَهَ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَةً وَاحِدًا It will be recorded that they did one act of 
Yani a sin. One sin. So, if a person intends to do an evil deed but does not do it, they get rewarded. But the condition is that they did not do the sin for Allah's sake. There's a big difference between a person is able to do a sin and then they hold themselves back because of Allah or somebody wanted to do a sin and there was something else that prevented them from doing the sin. It's not the same. You don't get the reward in that case. Right? So for example, a person wanted to do something haram. They wanted to steal something, مثلا. They wanted to steal something and then they realize that no, Allah is seeing me and I'm not going to do it for Allah's sake. They get the reward. But if they're only doing it because there's a camera in the corner of the room or they're scared they're going to get arrested so they don't do it, they don't get the reward. Does that make sense? Because if they were able to do it and they were not worried about that particular thing, they would have done the sin. Does that make sense? So there's a big difference. And inshallah we'll see next week in the next hadith which is the long, it's a long hadith, we'll leave it for next Wednesday inshaAllah ta'ala, which is the story of the three men that were in the cave. And each of them made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of them, the reason why he made dua, he said he was about to do a sin, but then he prevented from himself from doing the sin for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was a means for that person, for the rock being moved, as we will see in the hadith next week, because of that, that was, that was considered to be a good deed. He actually left the haram for Allah's sake and that was considered to be a praiseworthy thing. So the hadith is mentioning if a person does a, intends to do a sin, but they don't do it, they will get rewarded for it. And if they intend to do the sin and they do it, then they will get a, what recorded for them is one good deed. So the shahid of the hadith, the reason why it's mentioned in this chapter, is the, how the intention affects your actions and the reward connected to it. In one case, you intended to do a good deed, but you didn't do it because you were unable to do it. You get the edge of doing it. We mentioned the hadith earlier about the person who was prevented from doing the good, right? They, they want to come to salah, but they can't come to salah. Your intention is to come to the prayer. You come to the prayer all the time. But there's one time that you're prevented from coming to the salah. You have some symptoms of COVID, مثلاً. you have whatever. Something prevented you. You cannot come to the masjid. You get the full reward because of your niyyah. Okay? So here, this hadith is emphasizing the same concept. That your intention, if you, do, if you intend to do a good deed, but you're unable to do it, you'll get one reward. If you actually intend to do the good deed, and you do the good deed, you'll get, it gets multiplied by 10 automatically, or even more. And that's the virtue of Allah, or the ni'mah, or the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we'll stop here for today. We'll continue with the last hadith of the chapter next week, and then we'll continue into the next chapter, which is talking about tawbah, inshallah ta'ala, babu tawbah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for all of our shortcomings and all, all of our mistakes. We ask Allah to make us from those who listen and benefit from what we hear. Ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and yaj'alana min man yastami'una al-qawla fa yitabi'una ahsana. Innahu waliyu thalika wa ghadiru alayhi. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.